Edgelords, everybody's favorite characters. Universally respected and always an improvement to the media they're in. If only. Instead, the term edgelord has become an insult and complaint lodged against characters. A character being seen as an edgelord is a bad thing. But does it have to be that way? Are edgelords a universal negative to only be avoided? Well, first, what is an edgelord? I'd say any character that has edginess as a central tentpole of their personality. A character who is edgy is not necessarily an edgelord. Morgan is certainly edgy, but she's not an edgelord. Her mysteriousness and lack of understanding of the outside world are at the core of her character significantly more than the edge is. So, the main question here today, can proper, undeniable edgelords be good? Let's start simple and look at an edgelord that is already universally hated, and dissect how the character's edginess makes them so bad. But what edgy character could I bring up that nobody will like, and one where people who watch my videos are already familiar with all the- Kai Lang is exactly how not to do an edgelord. He is such a perfect example of doing one badly that he works as a good control group for this analysis. If you want a detailed description of how he hurts the game, well, I've already made a video on that. Instead, right now, I'm talking about his edginess in particular. Pretty much all of the sins common in bad edgelords are present in Kai Lang. Kai Lang is presented as immensely badass, but never does anything worthy of being considered so. He beats Shepard, the player, but only because the game makes Shepard incompetent in their encounters. He's supposed to be a reoccurring foe who you have multiple near-death battles with, but instead he gets a cheap win, then runs away. And the biggest problem with him that is so prevalent in similar characters is his absolutely flimsy motivation. Writers seem to think that not caring about things is cool, and so they make these characters that don't even have real goals. Characters like Kai Lang are why many people think a character being edgy is a total negative. Since these sorts of horrible characters stain many works of fiction, people despise the characterization entirely. But I truly think that edgy characters can be good, and I don't think they have to be any less edgy for it, they just have to be executed well. Let's look at a character who is very similar to Kai Lang on paper, but genuinely improves the game they're in. Monsoon from Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. Monsoon just shows up with zero buildup, goes on a rant about his philosophy, and most importantly, bosses around the already established villain, Jetstream Sam. On paper, this is no better than Kai Lang. He pops out of nowhere and presents himself as stronger and better than a properly established character. And Raiden just sits there watching him. But the thing is... The Monsoon section fucking kicks ass! It's an immensely self-indulgent section that you can't claim is anything but insanely edgy. It's a fight between two insane cyborgs in the rain as an incredibly over-the-top electronic metal song plays. Both combatants are displaying basically nonsensical feats in a crazy battle that's genuinely difficult and will absolutely butcher you if you've not mastered parrying. Monsoon works because the tone of the moment is something that only works with such an edgy character. He's the only villain with this type of attitude in the game. All the others are snarky and rather lighthearted for psychopaths. He comes at the exact moment where Raiden has basically been beaten down and lost confidence until he just has a psychotic break. Using one of the funnier villains in this moment would undercut the tragedy of Raiden basically relapsing. The game also has the self-restraint, which is not really a word you expect to be paired with this game, to leave Monsoon only in this moment where he works. He doesn't appear before this, and he's dead after. Monsoon's really not a very good character, but he's not supposed to be a character. He's a set piece who exists to reflect the hero. So often, games think that characters need a reoccurring presence for them to work as a dark reflection the way Monsoon does for Raiden in this moment. But honestly, edgy characters work horribly as reoccurring villains. They're almost always presented as being determined and having something of a death wish. So the second they flee, it just makes it seem like they're all talk. Look at fucking Hubert over here. The dude swears that he would happily die for Edelgard without any hesitation. Then he runs away four times. But enough about the worst character in Three Houses. Back to Revengeance. 
and we are going to focus entirely on Revengeance, because dear god, diving into the full Metal Gear Solid rabbit hole would double this video's length. Many edgy characters tend to settle on a tone and stick to it rather consistently. With their darker moments dragging them down a bit, and their lighter moments being far from silly. That is not the case with Raiden. His dark moments are fucking insanely edgy, more so than anything Kai Lang has ever said. But the thing is that his happy light moments are incredibly goofy. Raiden does a lot of stuff very admittedly for his own amusement. They manage the balancing act of making this and this still very much the same person. It makes these insanely edgy moments earned because we have something to contrast it to that is just as goofy as this is edgy. Now, let's look at a different gravelly-voiced, overpowered, white-haired, edgy twink. Fenris from Dragon Age 2. Fenris seems like an author's pet Mary Sue when you describe him, especially compared to the other companions in the game. Fenris is a former slave who was experimented on. He was given magic lyrium tattoos because he was his master's favorite. These tattoos have made him insanely powerful and given him the ability to make parts of his body incorporeal. But there was a side effect. He lost his memory. After he's escaped, he's been on the run, evading insane capture parties and killing hundreds because he's just so important to his evil master that he'll stop at nothing to get him, or specifically, his tattoos back. Also, he wields giant weapons despite being insanely scrawny and he's introduced like this. I don't know who you are, friend, but you made a serious mistake coming here. Lieutenant, I want everyone in the clearing, now! Captain! Your men are dead, and your trap has failed. I suggest running back to your master while you can. You're going nowhere, slave. <laughs> a slave. I apologize. Fenris seems awful. He seems like a character that doesn't even slightly fit, who's overpowered and a downer. But he's genuinely great. I honestly think he is the poster child for an unashamedly edgy character done well. Remember how I said the monsoon fight was good because it was perfectly self-indulgent? Dragon Age 2 has that same strength in regards to Fenris. The game is perfectly aware how edgy the character is. Mass Effect 3 seemed to be completely unaware just how fucking edgy Kai Lang is. Revengeance utilizes the self-indulgence by cranking the edgy so over the top that it's hard not to enjoy it. Dragon Age 2 uses it by lampooning Fenris, with characters treating him the way real people would respond to somebody so unapologetically edgy. And as arguably overwritten, as Fenris' backstory is, it's tragic enough that you could genuinely emphasize with his sad nature. His life fucking sucked, and it made him a sour guy. And even with it being magic tattoos that cause amnesia and give him crazy ghost powers, it boils down to the story of a man in a gilded cage irreversibly welded shut, and how he's determined enough to survive that he will drag that cage around with him for the rest of his life before he'll give up and die. The people he's running from are cruel enough that you understand his hatred and fear, and the lust for power that motivates them is something very real. It's a very human story with about 50 layers of fantasy magic paint. There's also the clear growth he goes through in the game. In the first act, he views you as a trusted ally, but there's always some tension. Through your actions, you can begin to move it towards proper friendship and even romance. Then, in Act 2, he's beginning to let his guard down after years of calm when his dark past suddenly rears its ugly head. If you don't help him deal with it, he goes after it on his own and you never see him again. If you do help him, you've become the person he can depend on most, and almost certainly his closest friend. He genuinely now has people he can rely on, and it has visible benefits towards his mental health. And in Act 3, he is actually getting out there, making more friends, starting to live a more normal life. You finally kill his old slave master, and despite it being far from a happy conclusion to his story, he's finally no longer on the run. 
The way he grows closer to Hawk and begins to let others into his life is reflected heavily in his attitude and dialogue. As the game progresses, he becomes less cynical. In Act 1, pretty much every line of his is melancholic or angry, and even when you make him laugh, there's still a sadness to it. But by Act 3, he's genuinely a much more lighthearted guy who enjoys the company of others. We play Diamondback. What? Why am I not invited to these games? He says you get angry when you lose. I do not. All right, perhaps I do. Still, that's no reason not to tell me. It is if he's a betting man. I disavow all knowledge of gambling occurring in my household. So, what can be learned from Fenris? Obviously just saying, right edgelords well, isn't helpful. And most games don't take place over multiple years the way Dragon Age 2 does, so spacing out the growth is far from a universal tactic. Rather, there is one specific thing that Fenris does right, which so many games get wrong when doing edgy characters. Most times, the edgy character does not want to be happy. The difference with Fenris, and pretty much any good edgy character, is that they do want to be happy, but they will not let themselves be happy. In the case of Fenris, he feels that to relax and be happy is to let his guard down, leaving him vulnerable to the people hunting him. And looking back at Raiden, in Revengeance, he does let himself be happy, viewing himself as a hero, until the bad guys begin to shred his psyche and he comes to the conclusion that he's just not compatible with a happy life, that he's a monster who can only ever bring death and violence. For a well-done edgelord, being happy should be something they always desire, but they resist as if it were a vice. They should have cheery moments and then look back on them as weakness because they feel they either weren't worthy of it or put people in danger by relaxing. Then, through the story, they should learn that they truly deserve to be happy and that it's okay for them to find peace, culminating in the satisfying conclusion of them letting in the support and love that they felt they had a duty to push away. Human beings want to be happy. It is a fundamental desire. A bad edgelord doesn't seem to actually want to be happy, and because of this, they are impossible to connect with. They're lacking basic humanity. This is not me saying that a character's goal should be to seek happiness, but rather that the innate desire for happiness should always be something that exists within the character. There are also plenty of other ways to screw up the character. This isn't some magic ingredient that does all the work, but rather the thing that I see screwed up the most. So that's a pretty good summation of how to make an edgy character good, and also how to fuck them up. But. There's a third type of edgy character. The ones who are the worst, in the best way. The edgy characters that are so edgy, they're funny. Take a look at this.
Shadow the Hedgehog. Anybody who's been keeping up with the channel is likely aware of the descent into madness this game caused me as I had to beat it 10 fucking times to get the true ending. But I digress, and I must say, this game is one of the funniest I have ever played. And it is not supposed to be. Unlike modern Sonic, there is not a hint of irony or meta humor in here. It takes itself 100% seriously. Shadow is a horribly executed edgelord that is written abysmally. This game genuinely does not make sense, as in at least half the plot is literally nonsense. He goes against basically any decent writing advice, and this whole thing is just a big fucking mess. But he is significantly more likable than Kai Lang is. Why is that? It's because Shadow reminds us of something near universal, and that's trying to be edgy as a kid. Shadow perfectly encapsulates the vibe of a middle schooler who really wants to be dark and brooding, but still only has a middle schooler's understanding of the world. A big part of it is the way that being edgy was clearly the goal of the writers here, rather than being a byproduct of the character's outlook. They clearly said, how do we make him more edgy? Because they thought that edgy equals cool. This complete and total dedication to edge ends up just being funny. But it's not just that. Look at Hatred, which I also played for this video, and is unironically a worse game than Shadow the Hedgehog. The main character, named Not Important, exists just to be offensive and edgy. There's no character here. They just wrote down a bunch of vague, angry lines and stuck them in the mouth of a crappy model with broken hair physics. Not Important is not fun. Nobody gives a shit about this incredibly forgettable character. But he and Shadow are written the same way. Both of them designed to be as edgy as possible before anything else. Why is Shadow insanely iconic, while literally nobody cares about Not Important? Well, before I talk about the differences, I need to stop and talk about how weirdly similar these two games are. Both of them are about backtracking through a level over and over until you've shot enough people to hit the arbitrary massacre quota. Both of them have fucking stupid save systems with annoying limited lives. Both have terrible movement controls. One of the bigger differences between the two is that Shadow the Hedgehog has some actually good music. Emphasis on some, the song's not great, but damn if it isn't hilarious. And when I say that in Shadow the Hedgehog you just backtrack around until you've shot enough people, that's not just the evil route. That's exactly what you do in the good guy route as well. You traipse the level gunning enemies down. It's just aliens instead of soldiers. Anyways, onto the differences. Well, I think that the trashy, attention-seeking subject matter of hatred makes it harder to find enjoyment in it ironically, I don't think that's the main issue. Hatred is a game that is as offensive and edgy as possible, just so that it stirs up controversy and gets attention. It worked, the game sold well despite being genuinely garbage. And this isn't me being offended, the game just actually sucks. It has an adults-only rating, and that's not the mark of doom it once was. The only limit to Hatred's content was keeping everything legal. Shadow the Hedgehog, on the other hand, had to be a game for literal children. Hatred is the same brand of edgy that any half-wit on 4chan can come up with. But Shadow the Hedgehog... Oh, it's beautiful. They wanted to make a game as edgy as possible, while keeping it mild enough for an E10 rating. And the vibe that creates is hilarious. Shadow has the same feel as a middle school edgelord, not just because this game's view of edginess is about as deep as a middle schooler's, but because, just like a middle schooler, it tries to be as edgy as it can get away with without getting in trouble with parents. And in the same vein, the second the game does anything that would actually be edgy and push limits, it immediately walks it back and apologizes. Like the cool rebel middle schooler having to apologize for saying a swear. Holy shit, Shadow nuked a city! Nah, it's alright, they evacuated literally everybody. He just blew up the equivalent of Air Force One and killed the president. And eh, the president's totally fine, somehow. The game constantly tries to act edgier than it's willing to be, and it's great. But why even bring all this up? Was this deep dive into making an edgelord ironically enjoyable actually needed? Did I just write this because I had to play through this game ten fucking times and I'd be damned if it didn't get discussed in the final video? <sighs> actually, no. Because you can intentionally recreate this type of edgelord to make something that is genuinely compelling. Using this ironic enjoyment in a more contextual manner to actually create an 
unironically good character. For a great example of what I mean, let's look at Fire Emblem Three Houses and everybody's favorite Sundere, Felix. Felix is a character that they took a massive gamble on. They had to get him perfect or he would have been one of the most despised characters in the game. But they actually did it and now he's many people's favorite character. For those who don't know Felix, he's a whiny asshole who only cares about fighting and spends about half the game insulting pretty much every other character. I'm going to avoid major spoilers because what matters is his attitude early game. Every student in Three Houses, with the exception of Mercedes and Hubert, is a teenager, and in many cases, this youth is used as part of their characterization in some capacity. With Felix, they put his age to use by making him a Shadow the Hedgehog style edgelord. He talks about how his dad sucks, he complains and gets in arguments with people, but he's never willing to get himself in trouble over it. There's a dance tournament where you send a student from your class to compete, and if you pick him, he complains relentlessly, and is more proud if he loses than if he wins. But he still follows through with it and goes through the training. They make it so he intentionally paints himself as brooding and edgy, and this edge is something that looks very silly from an outside perspective because he is an actual angsty teenager. As the game goes on, you learn much more about him and that pretty much every single aspect of him has some sort of emotionally logical backing. You see why somebody who is a genuinely good kid is so angry. But this video is long enough already, so just play Three Houses and see for yourself. In conclusion, good edgelords want to be happy. If they're a simpler character who's just edgy because they're edgy, the game needs to be aware of this and make sure they're used sparingly at the right moment. If the game is not aware of this, you get a bad edgelord who feels like a self-insert or DMPC. If the game actually thinks the flat, too cool, edgy character is interesting, the game suffers. And for funny edgelords, just write a character who's real fucking hyped for the My Chemical Romance tour.